And uh, it's one of those Old, pass Old Testament passages of Scripture. You know, sometimes you get Leviticus and Numbers uh, mixed up. You know, you get Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. And it's all having to do with our worship and our walk with the Lord. And uh, God commands us to be holy. And, and uh, it's not long. You see, Exodus is all about setting up the tabernacle. And then you get into Leviticus, and it begins to talk about the sacrifices that the Lord is, is, is expecting. One of the things that uh, was brought to light to me, uh, just even before the verse that we'll get to in just a moment, is uh, the sins of ignorance, not knowing uh, that you've committed something, but when it comes to the knowledge and then offering up those sacrifices that follow, uh, once it comes to the mind, and there's sins of omission and commission is often what we call them. And he deals with that early on. But then he comes here to Leviticus chapter 9. We're going to look particularly at verse 23. Uh, I guess, well, I'll, I'll get into that later. Let's, yeah, Leviticus 9.23. And you'll see where I'm going with this in just a minute because we're going to continue on in chapter 10. Leviticus 9.23, it says, And Moses and Aaron went into the congregation, into the tabernacle of the congregation, and came out and blessed the people. Now this is immediately on the heels of offering up all the sacrifices that God commanded. They're, they're inaugurating the priesthood as they'll go in and after this they'll continually offer up sacrifices every every week and just uh, especially during that time the day of atonement that would come and all the feasts they're, they're starting the priesthood initially this is what it's, it's coming to after they've sanctified the tabernacle and sanctified the garments and did all the prescriptions now they're offering the sacrifices and the blood's put on the, the right ear and the right thumb and the right toe and so on and so forth so he goes in and he offers up the sacrifice and then he uh, comes out and he blesses the people Again, verse 23, And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people, and there came a fire out from before the Lord, and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat. I mean, that had to be quite a scene to see. It says in the latter half, it says, Which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. It's one of those uh, things like when you look at the Apostle John over the book of Revelation in the very first chapter, and he sees the Lord in all of His glory. He says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I'm He which was alive and was dead and am alive forevermore. And it says that John fell at His feet as dead. I mean, any time that we come to worship the Lord, we, we see that people, how they responded. It's in reverence. It's in awe. It's in just mind-blowing fashion. Why? Because we're dealing with a God that's holier than, than we are and beyond our comprehension. And He accepts this sacrifice and He consumes it. And it's just an unimaginable thing. But now we go into chapter 10 and we'll look at these, just these first three verses in chapter 10. It says, And Nadab and Abihu, you say, uh-oh, I know where we're going. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either, took either of them his censer and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And then Moses said unto Aaron, This is it, that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me. And before all the people I'll be glorified in Aaron, Held his peace. I mean, what would you say? There's nothing that we could say in defense. The Lord is righteous in all of his actions. And these got Nadab and Abihu will pray in just a minute, but I just want to say this. Nadab and Abihu thought that they could replicate what God had done just earlier on, on the heels of something that God only God can do in obedience to the command that God had given. He accepted the sacrifice, devoured it with fire, but now Nadab and Abihu comes and tries to replicate that according to what they think is right, not according to the commands, but by what they want to do. And God devours them. God devours them. And so with that, let us pray as we get into the Word of God. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you just uh, hear... As I lift up my voice to honor you in, in every single way. The Bible tells us in Psalm 24, Who shall ascend to the holy hill and, and, and who shall stand in his, in his tabernacle? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. 
has not lifted up his soul unto vanity. Lord, I pray that you just help me to communicate your message and pray that uh, uh, at the end of the day, our worship is acceptable in your sight. Help us to follow in obedience to the command of your word and not according to our flesh and what we feel like doing. Lord, we know that our flesh is often the problem of everything that we do. But may we honor you tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. When man does things his own way, uh, <clears throat> we, we know what the ultimate result is, don't we? It's going to be failure. I was trying to think of maybe an illustration would bring to light the passage of the Scripture, but the truth be told, uh, it, it's, it's everywhere in everyday life. It's in Scripture everywhere that you turn. And it's just amazing to me that God does everything for man, and He puts him in such a, a great position, a place of privilege and, and, and power, if you will. Like, let's just say uh, Adam and Eve is there in the Garden of Eden. You couldn't think of any better place to be. But in that place, it seems like even in the position of highest dignity that's, that, that's there, man finds a way to mess it up, you know. And it's just that, re, that re thing that is recorded throughout all of history. You endow him with the greatest privileges. He'll abuse him. You scatter blessings around him. He'll, 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 he'll be just the most ungrateful for it. And we don't like to say those things. But it doesn't remove the truth of the matter. And this is what I find to do with Nadab and Abihu. You see, they have been given the highest position that there is. I mean, he didn't call anybody else to be the, the priest. And Nadab and Abihu, their, their father, Aaron, is the high priest. And if Aaron passed away, they would be the next high priest to ascend into that position. They, they had everything going for them and, and everybody would come unto them. To, to offer up their sacrifices. They had the privilege and the ability to go into the tabernacle of God to offer up these sacrifices. And it was something that Nadab and Abihu didn't take seriously. And can I tell you, our worship unto God, we must take it seriously. We must understand that we're not approaching God on our own terms, in our own way, the way that we feel like or the way that we want to. It's not what we want, but it's what God wants from us. And we got to come to Him in obedience with, with, our, with our hearts poured out and understanding that we're sinful creatures uh, that are offering sacrifices to a holy God. It's interesting, we see in contrast, at the close again, at the end of verse, uh, chapter 9, let us back up to chapter 8, verse, verse 35. Let me just read this to you. In chapter 8, verse 35, it says, Therefore shall... Ye abide at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation day and night, seven days. This is what God is telling Aaron and uh, his sons as they're being anointed and consecrated with a holy clothing. And he tells them, he says, you need to stay in, in the tabernacle seven, night, seven days, seven nights at the charge of the Lord, that you die not, for so I am commanded. And so Aaron and his sons, what does it say? They did all things which the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. But he did everything by, by the command of, of Moses. Of course, it's not Moses' necessarily. It's God's command that he tells them to follow. When they're doing everything according to God's way, we see the fruit of it at the end of chapter 9, uh, where he sees that sacrifice. He accepts it. He consumes it. The glory of the Lord is magnified. God is sanctified in the sight of all the people. He is reverenced. He is honored. Why? Because they did it according to God's way. But when we look at Nadab and Abihu, we see something done which God commanded them not. This is what he says at the end of very, the very first verse in chapter 10. He says, uh, they offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And we see that they were consumed because of it. At the, the end of chapter 9, God gets the glory. But at the beginning of chapter 10, we see that the same, uh, these who were offering up, not according to the command of God, they are consumed in judgment. And I tell you, we need to wake up to the way that we worship God in the house. This is His house. And Paul tells us over, I believe it's 1 Timothy chapter 3, after he lays out... Uh, the, the office of the bishop, which is the pastor and the deacon, he begins to lay it all out and he says that you may know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God. God doesn't put up with just anything and everything, but you wouldn't see that today. 
And I tell you, if we would be back in the Old Testament, I believe that there would be a lot more of this kind of thing happening. Because people are not sanctifying the Lord in their hearts. It's so on the heels of the priest's inauguration of joy, the manifestation of the Lord's acceptance came man serving their own selves, trying to reproduce the scene uh, that, that had just happened. Oh, if I could just do what God had done previously, oh, they'll fall down and worship. Look at what I can do. Look at the th- miracles I be- could perform, maybe if they were a prophet. And just like Simon, uh, when he, he sees that, uh, what was it? It wasn't Peter, it was... Um, Philip, and they're in Samaria. And there's this great revival that's taking place, and it sees that uh, whosoever uh, Philip lays his hands, they receive the Holy Spirit, of course, and you know, they, they received Christ as their Savior, and they filled with the Holy Spirit. And uh, Simon, the, 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 the magician, offers up a price. He, he wanted to pay to receive the gift. He wanted to be able to do what Philip did. And Peter rebukes him for it. It's just really amazing the things that happened early on in the early church and even uh, at the start of the uh, the tabernacle we see here. What begins in glory ends in humiliation and sorrow. What was their sin? The sin was strange fire. Well, we know that. But not a lot of people know what it means by strange fire. To be truthful with you, what I was doing my devotions and reading through, it just kind of, uh, that was my question. What was the strange fire that they offered up? Was it, uh, had to do with the, the censor that they were handling? Did it have to do with the coals of the fire? Did it have to do with the incense they were put on? What was the strange fire? That was my, what was interesting to me. And I tried to begin to study that out. And I see here that it was more or less uh, their failure to sanctify the Lord. To do things on God's, God's terms and God's way in obedience to His command. It was departing in their worship from the plain Word of God. To do things in their own way. It was failure to sanctify the Lord. Something, by the way, that Moses was very familiar with. We remember what Moses did later on in the book of Numbers chapter 20 where the Lord told him, the first time He told him to strike the rock with His rod But the second time when he told Moses, he said, what I want you to do, when they asked for water out of the rock, he says, I want you to speak to the rock. And Moses said, shall I draw water out of this rock, you rebels? And he struck the rock. And God rebuked Moses for the very thing. And you think, well, no, it's it's just a small thing. No, it's a big thing in the sight of God. God wants to be reverenced in the sight of His people. And He tells Moses, He says in Numbers chapter 20 verse 12, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, Because you believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you should not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Because you didn't sanctify me. Now folks, that's a, that's a big, big ordeal. God doesn't work on our terms again. If we think to the cross of Calvary and many of those, especially the, the, the two thieves on either side of the cross, even at the very beginning, says, if thou be the Son of God, bring yourself, save yourself, bring yourself down from this cross, is what they cried out. But I tell you, there was no other way for salvation. And that's what many people are trying to preach. They're trying to preach a, a, a salvation apart from the cross. They want to have a Joe Osteen sort of mentality. You know, if you can only believe it. You know, you should be as gods and so on and so forth. But folks, it must be a, a Christ, the, the, the cross where Christ died in our place and shed His innocent blood for you and I, His own precious blood, that we might be saved. We can't take Christ off of the cross. Paul said the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish. But unto them that are saved, it's the power of God. We've got to keep things in the right perspective. Uh, false religions will promise you salvation without a cross, abandonment without sacrifice, redemption without repentance. Well, if it's that case, why would Christ even have to come to this earth? And I doubt anybody could answer that. Because if we could do it our way, Christ wouldn't have to come and offer a shed blood on the cross of Calvary. He wouldn't need to have those nails driven through His hand and that uh, spear pierced through His side. 
But there must be a cross. There must be a borrowed tomb. There must be that stone rolled away. Or else there would be no salvation. There would be no gospel of Christ. And He left us here to be His witnesses. And I believe that our text uh, comes to instill fear of God that we might reverence His holy name. Psalm 24 says this, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in His holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord, the righteousness from the God of His salvation. That's what we want. We want to be acceptable, but we must have the righteousness of God. It requires a sacrifice. It requires us to do things God's way. We must sanctify the Lord God in our hearts. And this is very clear from the text. This is what Paul or what Moses brings out when he confronts Aaron. He says, this is what I told you. I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me. I will be sanctified. This is what Moses said. It was a lesson to all the nation of Israel. As Aaron and his two other sons would sit back and he would watch and see what happened to his own, his own children. You can imagine the mourning and the sorrow of his heart. Uh, what's going on there before his very eyes. The thing that uh, would just really grieve him to no end, I'm sure. But Moses tells Aaron, he says... God's not going to accept any sort of, of, of worship. He's not going to accept any sort of sacrifice. He's not going to accept any sort of doing it your way. This is not, not McDonald's. This is a holy God. The Apostle Paul, as he's writing... In the book of Hebrews, he says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And over and over again, it becomes plain uh, to us as we see the Scriptures' details, not just here, but in other places. We find in 2 Samuel 6, verse, verses 6 and 7, it says, And when they came, and this is David, when he thinks to bring the Ark of the Covenant down into Jerusalem, he says, And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, and the oxen shook, and the, for the oxen shook it, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error, and there he died by the ark. And we understand that uh, Uzzah came from the, 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 the tribe of, uh, well, his father was a Minadab, and his father was a priest and ministered in the priest's office. He would have been trained from a child on upward how to reverence and respect the house of God and how they are to, to bear the burden of the ark upon their own shoulders. He should have known, known that. But instead he begins to uh, have these oxen draw the ark on a cart, and I mean, it was, began to be his undoing. Instead of doing it God's way and following God's word to a T, he blew it and it cost him his life. And even it caused, here's what I can appreciate, David, the man after God's own heart, when he saw that very event take place before his eyes, it said that he began to fear. You know what we're lacking in this day and age, and you've heard me say it time and time again, is the fear of God before our eyes. David began to fear. We find over in Acts chapter 5, of course, uh, many of you who know your Bible, is Ananias and Sapphira, and they, uh, it's a time was where beforehand Barnabas came and f from the island of uh, was it Crete or Cyprus, I forget which one, and he comes and he sells all that he has that he might serve the Lord. He doesn't look back on his possessions, but he lays it all at the apostles' feet. It was something that was going on at that day and time that the people would come and they would put all things at the feet of the apostles for, for the needs and the ministry is what they were doing it for. But Ananias and Sapphira goes and sells their property and they only give a portion to it. And, and Peter you know, asks Ananias to come and appear before him and he says, uh, let me see if I can find it here in my notes. Peter said, while it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart, and thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God? And Ananias, hearing these words, it says he fell down, and he gave up the ghost. Can you imagine a, a, a more startling scene? 
It even says afterwards, it says that a great fear came upon all the church. As many as hear, heard those things, God would be sanctified in His church. Uh, they, did, they, you know, the thing about it is, is Ananias and Sapphira, they didn't, they didn't come and offer it up with, uh, with God's holiness in mind. No, they had their own selfish motives. And that's why they offered it. But the truth of the matter is, is that Aaron and his sons were in a privileged position. Nobody else had the position that they had. The garments that they were to wear was holy garments. The anointing oil, there was none like it which they were anointed with. They were put in a privileged position and they, they ought to have known better on the heels of knowing so much. They knew more than anybody else. It was clearly laid out before their eyes. Moses gave them explicit directions in how they were to behave themselves in the house of God. And yet, on the heels of knowing what they knew, to whom much is given, much is required. Immediately, they began to offer up strange fire. It's sort of like we look at Adam and Eve and they've been put in that, that privileged position and it's not long until immediately we, we read within just a very few couple, cha couple chapters that are there. It's not long after that, immediately. It was, the, the whole paradise was blown because of sin. But anyway, what does it mean to offer up strange fire? I could only find one other verse that I believe that could even come close to this. All right, Leviticus chapter 16, verses 12 and 13. You could just mark that down in your notes. Uh, it's not too far removed. It's Leviticus 16. And just these two verses. In verses 12 through 13, it says this. It says, And he shall... Take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it within the veil, and he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. And I'll just read verse 14 for the end of the paragraph here. It says, And he came and he took the blood of the bullock, sprinkled it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward, and before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. But that's how that they were to offer it up. I don't know if it was because they didn't have a, a sacrifice that was there to put upon their, uh, you know, the coals that were there after the sacrifice was burned up to take that specific coals and put it upon their censer and offer up that specific kind of incense that God told them to offer up. The only thing that I do know is, is just as I've read to you, that when they put this fire there on, when they put the incense into that fire. They called it strange fire. And the thing that we know that is so wrong about it, it says He commanded them not to do it. It wasn't the, it wasn't the manner in which He told them to offer it up. It wasn't the way that they were to offer it up. It was a direct violation of God's command. And, and it brings me down to these, just these very practical lessons, okay, for tonight. Our worship must be biblical. It must be biblical must be according to God's command, not, not uh, the way that we've thought that it needs to be done, not the way that we imagine things to be done. It's got to be the way that God prescribed it in His Word. It can't be man's imaginations. It's not that somebody sits back and it says, you know what, I wonder how we're going to entertain the people today, and they're sitting back and they're watching TV, and the latest uh, uh, um, televangelist comes on and they see the smoke screens and so on and so forth, say, that's a good idea. That's what's drawing the crowds. This is how we'll do it. And they go into church the next day and try to sell it to the people to say, this is how we're going to worship God from now on. No, that's, that is man's devices, not God's order. Those of you who've been reading through your Bible with us, remember that uh, Exodus and Leviticus... Um, you see this phrase over and over and over and over and over again. God gave the commands to Moses. Moses related it to the people. And it says, and they did as the Lord had 
commanded. They did as the Lord had commanded or as Moses commanded, or commanded by Moses. They would use one of the two phrases. And, um, you know, you can find it whether it's in Exodus or Leviticus. You would see it over and over again. God told them to make a tabernacle with certain dimensions. He got it when he was up on the mount 40 days and 40 nights. And uh, there as he was fasting and praying, God revealed to him the pattern of which he was to make the tabernacle a pattern just like in the heavens according to the book of, of Hebrews. But they had very specific dimensions. And when God called certain people, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not going to call their names because I want to butcher them, all right? But the men that He stirred up their spirits in order to make this, this, this tabernacle over. I mean, and they had great abilities to do the, the embroidery. They have the, the, the embroidery of the angels. I don't know how they figured out what the angels were supposed to look like, but as they did the embroidery, it had to be a specific instruction on how they do it, the specific colors. Today, you know, it's, people would easily get over debate about colors. You know, I say something's blue, and they say, no, that's not blue. That's uh, what's close to blue. Is it, peri I guess, periwinkle's close to purple. I don't know. I don't know colors, okay? But people get in debate about colors all the time. Turquoise, okay, we'll throw that color out. That's turquoise. No, that's blue. Well, somehow or another, God related the instructions to Moses. Moses told him what the instructions were to look like, and they made it exactly as God had commanded. And that's how they built the tabernacle according to the dimensions as they built the mercy seat and as they built the two hovering angels over top of the mercy seat where God would commune with His people as they put together and pieced together the priest garments. Even as the, the, the 12 stones that they would have on there, the specific kinds of stones, the, 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 the miter upon His head that says, Holiness to the Lord. Everything about what Moses was to, or, or, or Aaron was to do and the, the dimensions of the tabernacle and Moses' behavior. The, the, you see what I'm saying? It was all according as God wanted it to be. This was not Moses' imagination. It's a shame. And you've heard me use this illustration before about uh, over in the... I can't remember if it's the book of Chronicles or the book of Kings... And I think it might have been Manasseh who went, it may not have been Manasseh, but one of those kings who went in and he saw what the king of Assyria had done over in Damascus and he liked the altar set up and he went and tried to do that in the house of God. And it was an abomination. We see several things like... Um, in the book of Ezekiel, where they would bring in these images and bring them into the house of God as they worshiped the Queen of Heaven, it was an abomination. Over and over again, we read, just as the Lord had commanded Moses, that's how they were to do things, according as God had said, or as He had revealed them unto Moses. Moses was uh, His mediator between God and man during this time in the Old Testament period, and revealed you know, the commands through Moses to the people, and He told them, this is how it's supposed to be done. We don't approach God on our terms, but on God's terms, all worship is to be just as God had prescribed for it to be, with no variations, you know. No, it wasn't to be like, well, maybe there's room for, I like it better this way. Yeah, I think we do too much praying and maybe we ought to do something else. There's too much of preaching of God's Word, we ought to do it another way. You know, the preaching's too hard sometimes and I don't like the way it is. And so maybe we'll just have a different kind of preaching. Now, there was to be no variations from what God had said or what God had wanted. We weren't free just to do whatever we want. And neither were Nadab and Abihu. And God had certain plan that He wanted them to follow. God struck them down for their disobedience and their presumptions to try to worship in the way that they wanted to. When we come to the house of God, we don't sit around and wonder. Wonder how God, uh, wonder how God wants us to worship today. I know I have a plan, and, and, and they come up with this plan, and they say, well, this is how... We... He doesn't leave it up to our imaginations. He has it all written down in this book, doesn't he? 
They said, this is how I want you to do it. This is how I want you to behave in the house of God. We don't, we don't go by what man expects. We go by what God expects. We, we know what we're to do. He tells uh, Timothy, Paul tells Timothy over in 1 Timothy, he says, uh, till I come, give attendance to the reading of the word. We understand it. He tells us over in 2 Timothy, he says, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and, and, and doctrine. That was a man's idea. That was God's idea. He says, please God, through the foolishness of preaching to save them that are lost. He over and over again, he uses weak vessels such as myself as a voice to reveal God unto the people that they might hear the preaching of the Word of God and be changed by it. We're to contend for the faith, not for our feelings. And I believe today we get things so twisted and so backwards. They've tried to change the gospel to a feel-good gospel. There's only one gospel. And that's the gospel that we get to. That's the gospel that saved our souls. It's laid out in 1 Corinthians 15. If anybody has any doubt about the gospel, all you have to do is look at those first four verses and it's clear as day. We know that we're going to have songs and the Bible tells us about singing and psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Songs was a part of the Old Testament. We remember uh, reading about David as he sets up the, the order of service there in the tabernacle and he would have his musicians and, and, and over again in the book of Psalms you would read about Asaph who was one of their musicians or Korah, one of their musicians that would go out and sing these songs of praise lifted up to God as they would go and worship Along with the sacrifices, along with the worship service, there would be songs involved in the worship. We know that we're going to pray. Why? Jesus said this, My house should be called a, 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 of all nations a house of prayer. Mark chapter 11 verse 17. It tells us in Luke chapter 18, you know, Men ought always to pray and feign not. I mean, if Jesus had to pray, we ought to pray. Pray was a part of the... the, uh, the Every part, of, even if before the law, it tells us over in Genesis chapter 4, uh, after Seth came along, then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't, you know, the, the law came along and then we started praying. Praying was before the law. It was a part of worship. It was a part of, of what God wanted. We know that we want to give because God says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, Malachi 3.10. And He says in 1 Corinthians 16.2, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God had prospered. And by the way, uh, it seems that uh, I don't know why this is going on, but I'm starting to see a little bit more of this. Um, does some people think, well, you know, this first day of the week doesn't really matter anymore. What really is the first day of the week? Well, I'll tell you what the first day of the week is. The first day of the week is when Jesus rose again from the dead. That's when the disciples were gathered together. And that's when they worshipped. And that's when they, they gathered together. It was on Sunday, not on Saturday, the Sabbath day, when the Jews would gather together. It was on Sunday when the Lord rose again from the dead. It began to inaugurate a new event. It was a special day, a holy day. It was a great day, the day that the Lord rose again from the dead. And we're going to share our testimonies. Uh, several times, you know, whether it's a morning service or evening service, I'll ask you guys, do you have a testimony or something to share, a praise to share? That was a part of the sacrifices and worship back in that Old Testament time and New Testament times. It says in Psalm 35, 18, I'll give thee thanks in the great congregation. I'll praise thee among much people. And we know from time to time that we're going to observe the Lord's Supper. That's a part of it as well as baptisms and um, the, the two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper. We know that's all part of what God designed for worship services. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you is we don't have to doubt God's design for our worship. Sometimes I think that we forget that God's called us to holiness. And I tell you, it's a sad event that the day that we lose holiness. And God's people, He says, be holy for I am holy. It's not 
that lingo that many people use today, the old man upstairs or however they say it, I'm not sure anymore. They, the lingo has changed from time to time and even by the time I get figured out, uh, you know, this whole texting business and so on and so forth, I've given that up a long time ago. Uh, I don't know if you send me a text with abbreviations, I don't know what that means. So you can just forget about it. But I'm saying when it comes to God, we need to recognize His holiness. I know, I know I mention that over and again. But it's important to our worship. We're not to sit around and dream up new things and figure out how we can entertain. This is the thing. That in many people's homes... They go home and they watch TV and they have all this entertainment coming their way. And they receive it from the TV. They see it from the entertainment world. They receive it from the business world. They receive it when they're on their social media and they're scrolling through, going through Facebook and going through whatever have you. I'm glad for um, Brother Sheely and Brother Coon that you don't have Facebook. That's a good thing. Praise the Lord for that. But Miss Martha keeps you in, in to form with what's going on in the world. All right? But I tell you, you could spend hours and hours going through there and we can look at the TV and we can listen to the radio and we can get this mindset that, uh, you know, I need to be served, I need to be entertained, I need to be amused, I need to feed my flesh. Why? Because that is what you're doing all the day long. When we don't spend time to get together alone with God and do our morning devotions and say, God, I need to hear from heaven. God, I need your word. God, I don't have all the answers today. I need your help. Lord, I'm weak, but I know you're strong. God, I know that you're omnipotent and you know all things, whereas I stand sometimes in doubt and Lord, help my unbelief where, where I feel like I'm failing you. Lord, make me stronger according to your word. Lord, order my feet according to your word. Let it be a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Lord, show me more of yourself. Show me your glory even as Moses prayed. There's very few of that going on. And we wonder sometimes why people can't pray more than 10 seconds to say, Lord, thank you for our food and then dig into the meal. And we wonder why there's not more worship and more holiness and more reverence while we're not doing things according to the way that God wants us. It's because we've, we've been influenced by the world and the world is dictating the worship of the church. And can I tell you, it's got to be the opposite way of around when we have holiness and we're doing it the way that God has designed it, the worship service in the church. We can impact the world, but I'll tell you, the way that it is now with the mega churches and the TV screens and the lights and the fog machines and this and the drum sets and so on and so forth, the worldly entertainment that's coming into the church, that's the strange fire that the Bible is warning us about. When people is doing it according to man's devices, no word to worship the Lord. Uh, it was the same problem when Jesus came across the woman at the well in John chapter 4, where it says, where she came up and she says, Lord, you know, uh, Jacob built this well, and our fathers, we worship here in this place. You guys worship over in Jerusalem. And he says, Woman, you don't know what you worship. Can I tell you, you can go in the average church today and they don't know what they worship. But we must worship God in spirit and in truth. This is how the Father is pleased. With all the confusion today, we need to stick by the book. God doesn't want us to do it our way. He wants us to do it His way. Look at verse 10, if you will, by the way. Uh, to just read chapter 10, Leviticus 10, verse 10, just to... So you know, it's not my words. This is God's word when he says, And that you may put a difference between the holy and the unholy. Between the unclean and the clean. God wants us to set a difference. And he says it over even in the, what we refer to as the major prophets. You'll even read about it over in Jeremiah and in Ezekiel both. Where they say that they may set a difference between the holy and the profane. It's not just in the first five books of the Bible. It's all through the Bible that God says there must be a difference. Just as there must be a difference between us and the world. We're to be faithful unto the Lord. My calling is to remain faithful to God, not to fill the seats through worldliness. 
We've got enough worldliness in the world. I'm not to promote, I am to promote holiness and the fear of God. The average church worship knows nothing about Abraham offering his son Isaac on the altar. You know, they talk about worship, don't they? And they're worship, I mean, they're singing, they're making a big show out of things. But I don't read where Abraham took his only son, the son whom he loved. The guy told him, he says, I want you to go on top of the mountain and I'll show you and offer your son. He didn't make a show out of that. It was going to cost him something, but he recognized that God was able to, again, to raise him from the dead. And thank God that he didn't have to take his life, but he told him, he told Isaac, he says, My son, God will provide himself a sacrifice. Worship costs something. We read with David as he's talking about, you know, and when he messed up and numbered the people, and then that plague came upon all the nation of Israel. Many died, and the 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 the, the death angel came and was over the the threshing floor of Arowana. And you remember the scene that was up there. And you remember what David said to, uh, I think it was named Arowana. And he said to him, he says this, he said, Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which cost me nothing. Again, our, our worship must be biblical. And then it must be reverential. It must be reverential. Reverent. He says, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. This is a word of warning for our worship today. When we think of just being overly familiar, um, to be fast and loose with God, to treat Him like uh, he's, he's your next door neighbor or your brother, or to be casual with God. You see what I'm saying? Because that's, the, that's the, what's going on in many places. You go down to a New Spring church. And they're casual with God. And they treat him like he's just, he's just like an average guy. And, you know, he suffered like you suffered. Yes, he did, but he was holy, uh, undefiled, separate from sinners. And people were flippant in their worship. They're, they're too casual with God. He insisted he'll be treated as holy. Our worship must be uh, reverent and respectful to the holiness of God. This, I was taught growing up, and you've heard me say this before, but uh, we were to be respectful to the police officers. You know, they're, they're traveling down the street, you know, and you, know, you want to get out of the way, especially if those blue lights are going, and if they pull you over, it's because you did something wrong, probably. But you respect the police officer. I don't see that today. We respect the authority of the law according to Romans chapter 13. You know, God, they, they are ministers of God for, for righteousness in the land. Uh, I was taught to very early on to respect my elders, respect my parents. There, there was a lot of reverence and respect. The book of Hebrews tells us, it says, if you have reverence under your parents who, who chastened you after your pleasure, how much more so should you reverence the Father of lights and live? But there's this, this, the president, you know, if the president came in, you're, you're, there's supposed to be a certain air of respect. I think that we've lost that in our day and age, but uh, there, there's a respect with the office. And by the way, I say that we ought to pray for those in authority over us. That's what the Bible commands. But can I say this, as much as we reverence the police, or as much as we respect the police officer, as much as we respect our parents, as much as we respect the office of a president, God is so much more than any of those things. Man is sinful at his best, and, and he's going to make mistakes, and he's going to falter, and he's going to fail. But God is holy, he's higher, he's as such as uh, Isaiah found out in, in uh, Isaiah 6 vision, when he saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple, and he said, holy, 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 holy is the Lord of hosts, and it just the, the temple shook because of that. 
and cause Isaiah to say, Woe is me, for I'm undone, for I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. We can't get things out of order. I know that uh, uh, I'm, I'm running out of time, but just bear with me for, for just a moment. Um, I believe Adam and Eve found out what it was res- like to respect God after they were cast out of the Garden of Eden. You see these things going on around you, whether it's with Nadab and Abihu or Adam and Eve, or whether it's with uh, Ananias and Sapphira. You, you, you learn very quickly, hey, I need to heed what God says, and I need to reverence Him. I need to pay attention and obey Him, whatever He wants I'm to do. Why? Because He is of authority. He is... He is the one to whom all the earth is to be silent before Him. In this day and age where people run their mouth and they talk about God as if they got them all figured out. A lot of people have turned away from God. They don't know who He is anymore. They just feel good enough to just relish in their sin and dare God to challenge them and to try them. It's of God's mercy that He doesn't wipe us all out. But then it not only must it be reverential, but it must be God-focused. In verse 3 it says, And Aaron held his peace. The fire of the Lord, which recently um, fed upon the acceptable sacrifice, I mean it consumed it, had now fallen in judgment upon Nadab and Abihu. And, and what could Aaron say? What could Aaron say? Nothing. As tragic as that was, Aaron was to learn as much as his love for his sons were, he's to reverence God more and respect God more. God is to be the center of his attention. Moses was telling Aaron that he needed to keep in mind the seriousness of what he was doing in worship and not dishonor God in any way. Even when he watched his own sons die before his eyes, his respect for the Lord was to be greater than anything he showed toward men any men, even his own sons. And this shows us that our worship is to be God-focused, respecting God more than anyone else or anything else. We have to realize that God is greater than, than all. I, I'm of the persuasion that we need to welcome our guests in and treat them nice and to take care of them. If somebody comes into the church service and they sit down, we want to be able to assist them. Or do they be able to come alongside, hey, do you need a Bible? Can I help you with that? Do you need help with a hymn book? We don't know if they've ever used one before a day in their lives. And we need to be of help and of a service. But can I tell you this? We need to be uh, uh, paying more attention to be honoring God above even our guests to come into the church. I like the fact, I remember when I was at uh, uh, Victory, Pastor Preacher Henry Nichols, um, this is even before he passed away, he got to see where uh, the, the incoming pastor, Pastor Reese, I think it was, he dedicated uh, Fellowship Paul to Preacher Henry Nichols. And, uh, but can I tell you this? God's to be reverenced more than the preacher. God's to be more than the center of attention more than anybody else. The most important focus in worship is not to be our guest, not who gives the most money, not the power structure of the church, not, not what people think, not what people want, not what... Uh, uh, I mean, just go down the list. The center of our our worship is to be all Christ-centered, all God-focused. He's to be the center of our attention in everything that we say and do. He's got to have our soul of... uh, Why else would you be here? (laughs) Folks, I'm no better than you are. I don't know why God would call me to preach, but thank God for it. But I'm here for Him. I'm not here to impress you. I'm here for, for God because of what He's done in my life. Sometimes you wonder, what, what does God see? And I hope that every time that I pray, I don't, I don't pray in vain, but I want God to be accepted with, the, with our preaching, with our song service, with the musicians at the piano and at the clavinova for every part of the service. I want them to be pleased. I want them to be pleased with everything that I say and do. In every way, worship services should not be about calling attention to ourselves. They should always call attention to our God. 
Listen, God saves. God saves sinners. He loves all those who will come unto Him and shower His love down upon them. I mean, yes, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the only way of salvation is through what Christ has done for us, putting our faith and dependence in Him alone. And He's the one that took our judgment for us. And thank God for that. Thank God for that. That I, I, can, I can just have the privilege of being called the Son of God to be seated together in heavenly places because of what He's done. Having His righteousness and not my own, as the Apostle Paul would say. And I hope tonight as we finish out here in the Word of God that you would see my heart and understanding that uh, yes... We, we, we need to worship God, but our worship must be done in a particular pattern, in a particular way to, to uplift the name of Christ. It's got to be biblical. It's got to be reverential. God needs to be honored in every single service. We're not to, to act a fool in a service. We're not to put on a show in a service. And it's got to be God-centered in everything that we do. He's got to be the center of our prayers, the center of the preaching of the Word of God. He's got to be the center in every hymn that we sing. He's got to be the center in everything that we do, whether in, in, in every single ministry that we have to offer. He's got to be the center of all. And I pray to God that He is. The challenge is, will God be sanctified not only in the service, but in our hearts as we worship Him? Peter says this, Sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be ready to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. And let us sanctify, let us truly sanctify God in our hearts tonight. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You for this time together. And I pray... That in every single service, Lord, that we come to, expecting God to show up. Lord, I, I love the fact that as we read through chapter 9 at the end of that and how you came in and was such a great start to the worship in the tabernacle service. You, you, you consumed the, the sacrifice from off of the altar and Lord, you sh showed up in a powerful way. And Lord, that's what I want for every single service. For you to be magnified, for you to get, to get the glory, not me, not this preacher. But for you, Lord, help us to sanctify you in our hearts. To live in a way that we reverence you with every breath that we take. That we come here not to please the flesh, but to please our Savior. Who saved us by the grace of God. Lord, may you be honored in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, let's stand to our feet as we'll sing our hymn of invitation, Rock of Ages. It's hymn number 129. 129. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in Thee. Let the water and the blood from Thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. My tears forever flow. Could my zeal no longer know these for sin could not atone thou must save and thou alone in my hand no price I bring simply to thy cross I cling while I draw this fleeting breath when mine eyes shall close in death when I rise to worlds unknown and behold thee on thy throne, rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Amen. I think of the world around us and certainly I 
uh, one of the things that really stands out to me uh, as I was preparing for the message again is that uh, everybody wants to be entertained this day and age. We don't need more entertainment. We need more God. And so I pray that you'll carry that out with you tonight as we go our separate ways. Brother Sheely, would you mind closing us in a word of prayer?